Welcome back to the Grodi Farm. I'm Marcus Grodi, the president founder of the Coming Home Network International, and this is our second on location shoot out here at the farm. Our, our, our studio manager had been pushing me to come out here, and so it was such a beautiful day, we thought we would, we would do this. And as I thought about what I might cover this time, a, a scripture came to mind that actually I'd been looking at in relationship to another program that I do called Deep in History that I co-host with Monsignor Steenson. We've been for many months studying through Irenaeus' wonderful book Against Heresies. And I'm going to bring that up a little bit later in this discussion. But <clears throat> the question arose in against heresies, as well as in uh, the scripture I'm going to look at. Irenaeus brought up this question. And he says, and this is in book five, chapter 20, he says, he's talking about the horde of false teachers that have already arisen in and around the church, and we're talking about the late second century. And he's the reason he wrote this book was to help people know what is true and, and how to make sure they're following Jesus Christ. And he makes a statement to not follow those false teachers, lest we be cast out of the paradise of life into which the Lord bringeth those who obey his instruction. The call there was to obey his instruction. The reason this came up in the discussion is how, how do we know for sure? How can we be, um, have the assurance of knowing that we're following the teaching of the Lord in our life for the rest of our life so that one day when we stand before God, we, we stand before him uh, humbly, but without embarrassment. In other words, uh, we, can, we can look him straight in the eyes and, and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. How do we know the fullness of the gospel? The problem for the time of Irenaeus, as it is for today, is there are lots of people speaking in the name of Christ, many people quoting from scripture, many people claiming to be founders and heads of churches. And now with the internet, I, I bet there's a new church starting every day. They're all claiming these things. But how can we be certain that what we're believing and following in those churches or whatever church we're in is true? And <clears throat> Timothy, or excuse me, Paul talked to Timothy about the same issue. And so the scripture that I thought we'd reflect on out here in this uh, field. Now, those of you that watched the last video, you may have remembered that the grass was up to here and there were flowers and my cows were hiding in the grass. Well, this is the same field that's been mowed and been uh, grazed. And my cows have grazed this down to the nubs and I've moved them into a different paddock uh, that yeah, I think you may have seen pictures of earlier. Uh, and now that here we are in spring, I'm going to be moving them into different pastures as the grass starts to grow. I'm looking at <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with the end of verse 2 and then 3. Now, uh, I'm, I'm speaking from this, not preaching from it, because I need to hear what this is saying. What I've always been fascinated about the letters from Paul to Timothy was I always assumed they were a bit different than all the other New Testament epistles. In every other case, Paul or James or the author of Hebrews or John or Peter were writing to a church or to groups of people knowing that what they were writing was going to be read and then preached and then passed on to lots and lots of people. But these letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, two of them, and then one to Titus, and even the one to Philemon, were more personal letters. And we can't necessarily assume that Paul, when he wrote this, 
assumed that others would hear besides Timothy. So it's really the old apostle who's soon to die um, writing to the young bishop who's been assigned at Ephesus. And Paul is telling his novice how to lead the people in his position. And he begins this by saying, teach and urge these duties. So Paul's telling Timothy, okay, here it is. It's the end of the letter. He said so much, but he comes to the end of the letter. And he says, now, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching which accords with godliness, I want to pause there. See, the issue is that there are others that are going to be teaching things different than Paul taught, than James, Peter, John taught. And so the question is, how do we know? How can we be sure? Here we are 1900 years later. How can we be certain that what we are following is true? And he, he gives two things that we've got to agree with. He says, now, Timothy, now make sure that what you're teaching agrees with one, the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and number two, the teaching which accords with godliness. The sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching which accords with godliness. So how do we know those two things? Well, the first is the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've received those in the gospel, of course. I'm going to turn to Irenaeus because uh, I've had my head in this a lot lately as Monsignor and I have been going through the book, but he deals with this question. Beginning of book three, Irenaeus. Now, the significance of Irenaeus is not that we think of him as inspired, equal with scripture. No, he's an early witness. And the majority of scholars, whether Catholic or Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, all agree that Irenaeus, a well-respected bishop, had learned his faith from Polycarp, who had learned his faith from the Apostle John. And so we have the apostle, you have Jesus, the apostle John, to Polycarp, to Irenaeus. And so an early witness of the truth passed on to, I mean, the direct connect here between Jesus, John, Polycarp, but Irenaeus. In the beginning of book three, he says, the only true life-giving faith which the church hath received from the apostles and dispenses to her sons, for indeed the Lord of all gave to his apostles the power of the gospel. And by them we have known the truth. In other words, the teaching of the Son of God. So there it is. There's the teaching of the Lord that we've re we know now. We have that our Lord gave to his apostles. Remember, he promised the Holy Spirit to give to them so they could remember all that he had taught them and, and pass it on. And they've been passed on to Polycarp and now to Irenaeus, and then he passed it on to the places where he served. He goes, on, he goes on, for by no others have we known the method of our salvation than those by whom the gospel came to us, which was both in the first place preached by them and afterwards by the will of God handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. Now, there's so much more that Irenaeus says, but so we have this deposit of faith, and part of it is the tradition of the teachings of our Lord Jesus that he passed on to his apostles that were passed on to their successors. And the goal of the church, if you will, is to guard that. It still is to guard that, to make sure that on the one hand, we can know the teachings of Christ. But Paul said something else. He said also the teaching which accords with godliness. And at the time Paul's writing this letter to Timothy, we presume he didn't realize that his letter would one day be a part of a book we call the New Testament. And so we have the words of our Lord, and then we have the words of the apostles, Paul, Peter, James, John, and the writer of Hebrews, passing on reflections on the teachings of Christ, applying them to the lives of uh, the early Christians. But we also know that there was more to that. Let me grab back here with Irenaeus because he also says, 
in book three, the proofs therefore being so abundant, we ought no more to look for the truth el elsewhere, which it is easy to obtain from the church. The apostles having therein most abundantly deposited as in a rich storehouse, whatsoever appertains to the truth. And it's that apostolic succession an apostolic deposit of faith. Wherefore we ought shunning them, meaning the false teachers, with all diligence to love what belongs to the church and to lay hold of the tradition of the truth. For why, though the dispute were but of some ordinary question, would it not be meet to recur to the most ancient churches where the apostles went in and out and from them to receive on any present question that which is certain and clear and indeed. So here's the early idea in the church that if you want to know what is true, you go to a church that we know received it from an apostle. And to be sure that what's being passed on has not been corrupted, it's been guarded. And he goes on, and what if not even the apostles themselves had left us any scriptures? What if they hadn't written it down? What if they hadn't written it down? Then what? He says, ought we not to follow the course of that tradition which they delivered to those whom they entrusted with the churches? So the idea is we have these two things, these two things that were passed on, the words of Christ and the reflections of those in the Gospels and the epistles but we also have the tradition, the wider deposit of faith that was passed on. And that's what, of course, Irenaeus is one of the first books that brings it all together and talks about this. And if you want, you can go to our Deep in History program. So Paul is telling Timothy, make sure that what you are teaching is based on those two streams of truth, the sound teaching the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching which with accords, which accords with godliness. Now, again, I'm going to pause there. This whole thing is about this, this need for us to grow in godliness. Godliness. Now, what is that? It's going to come up a little bit later that sometimes people misunderstand what godliness is. And they, they kind of think that godliness is more focused on a trait of myself, that I'm going to grow in godliness. What does that mean? I'll do this or that or not do this or that or believe this or that and then ask God for the grace and then I'm going to exude godliness. And I suppose a little bit of that true. We want people want to be able to see Jesus in us. But it's interesting to to know that the word godliness comes from a Greek word that's very rare in the New Testament. In fact, it's almost only in Paul's pastoral epistles and in the second letter of Peter. It comes from a, a, a Greek word and the core of that Greek word means to stand apart, to stand, stand back from my college just reminded us that we're out on his pasture to stand back. It's kind of funny that I, I saw that when I read it up because we're living at a time when we're, we're supposed to keep a distance from one another, six feet. Um, but the word for godliness is based on the idea of stepping back from God. In other words, in awe. It's a New Testament word that parallels the Old Testament world, word of fearing God. Godliness is not about us. Godliness is about him. The focus of growing in godliness is always about him, his awe, standing in awe of him, uh, stepping back and recognizing we're in his presence. Again, all those images, I think, of C.S. Lewis's uh, discussion about Aslan, the lion, and this awesome creature. Um, or in the last discussion that we had out here at the farm, I talked about the evidence of God all around us. Do we see it? It's not about us. It's about him. So growing in godliness is becoming more and more and more about him. I reverence 
of God in our life and every aspect of our life. So then he goes up. So he's, I paused at the beginning, of, 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 in the middle of that sentence, where Paul says, okay, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the teaching which accords, I've got to pause here again, because I know from my background, when I was a Protestant pastor, that we tended to focus more on the teachings of Paul than the words of Jesus. We didn't talk much about the Sermon on the Mount. It was almost as if that's two works righteousness. So that must be before the cross. It doesn't relate to us anymore. We only have to listen to Paul. And here we have Paul telling us to focus on the words of Christ. In fact, this whole section, the best way to understand this whole section is to see it as Paul expounding on the Sermon on the Mount. Everything Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is here behind the words of Paul. So he goes on, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching with the cords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit. He knows nothing. He has morbid craving for controversy and for disputes about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, base suspicions, and wrangling among men who are depraved in mind and bereft of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Now, do you, do you hear in that description a description of so many of the alternate gospels that have existed throughout the last 2,000 years and are in plenitude today on the internet that you can listen to and the religion is all about ourselves and how if we are in, in right place with God, we should see the benefits of it in our lives. In other words, a godliness as a means of gain. And anybody teaching Godliness as a means of gain is out of touch with what is true. Because the truth is that our Lord talks over and over in his Sermon on the Mount is that our primary rewards are not here. They're there. Our rewards are an intimacy with him. When we see the evidence of him, we experience him in life, we receive his forgiveness, we receive his graces. But it doesn't necessarily mean that if he's if we're in rights with God, our bank account's going to go up. But he's already addressing the fact that there are people, even in his day, saying that very same thing. And I think there are an awful lot of other Christians, Catholic or non, that might say, oh, I'm not one of those health and wealth gospels. I, I'm not that. You're not talking about me. But they live their life as if the way they live their life, the way they accumulate and fill their lives with stuff, is no connection with the relationship with Christ. What is godliness? It's about putting him first and letting him guide the priorities of our life. He doesn't put down godliness. He says godliness is, is the goal. He goes on, for there is great gain in godliness with contentment. Those are together. Godliness with contentment. It reminds me of, of a scripture in Philippians 4 where it says to have no anxiety about anything but with prayer and petition with thanksgiving make your requests known to God and the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding will be yours. Well, we have this partnership, prayer and petition with thanksgiving. There's an important attitude of being grateful to God for all that we've received. Here he's talking about the important criteria that helps keep godliness in line is an attitude of contentment, recognizing that God does provide, God does hear, God does love, he does forgive. And to be to content rather than being drawn away into the temptations that are all around us for the constant goal for more, for more. Here he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about the Sermon on the Mount. 
for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Food and clothing, with these we shall be content. <clears throat> Boy, we're far from that. I think maybe in his day, he didn't have to focus on a long list of things. I think the philosophers talk about food and water, clothing and shelter. If you read my book, Life from Our Land, I talk, well, we need to be close to a church. And we live in a culture now where it's almost impossible to survive without a car, health care. I mean, the list goes on and on. But how do we measure contentment? In my book, I talked a bit about this and um, I thought about just referencing one chapter that deals with this issue of contentment. But when I reread the things that I put here, I find them as a personal challenge. And in, in one of my chapters, I, I talk about um, our economic future and I address the, the issues that we're facing in our world. And it's getting kind of scary. You listen to the news, maybe better not listen to the news, but I, I put seven things um, that I was suggesting on how we can rein in and grow towards contentment in a world where we're bombarded with other voices, other gospels, other ideas that are telling us that uh, the priority is not about uh, focusing on God and, and his priorities for us, standing back in awe of God, uh, but to kind of erase that and look around us and look at what they're getting and what we could have and, uh, and, and get caught up in this constant, constant hunger and thirst for more. And I gave seven things. And these are in the book and, and I'll pass these along, but I encourage you if you want to buy the book and listen. Actually, I think the article that this was written in is on our website. But I begin by suggesting that we, we begin by focusing on what is stable and established. In other words, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talked about, look at the birds and look at the flowers. And is it just that because he uh, was a flower boy or, or was he saying these are, this, this retakes our focus away from all the other crazy stuff. And in many ways, when we look around us, not only do we see the evidence of God, as St. Bonaventure pointed out, I talked in the last episode, but we see things that have not changed all that much in thousands of years. They've been affected by our lack of stewardship but we look at a tree, we look at the grass, we listen to the birds, we look at the stars, we look at clouds, we look at things, and we see things that God has placed within his creation that have been here forever. And we recognize these are messages from God to turn our focus back to him. And when we can focus on that, it helps sift the, the grasp that that world, that changing world around us. You know, I wrote this book, about five years ago, and I can't believe how much the world has changed in five years. It's just crazy. So we focus, we appreciate, we be content with the stable, wherever we're at. You don't have to be out here on my manure covered farm. You can be wherever you're at, but you might need to go outside and just pause. The second thing I said is to reduce the incessant voices, reduce the voices, the input, Turn off that electronic thing for at least a little bit. Pause. Appreciate. And then thirdly, reduce the financial encumbrances in our life. That's how they've got us. The more we're in debt, the more things we want and get cleased, the more we're attached, we're enslaved. The more we can detach ourselves from that, the freer we are. Then fourthly, I said, practice personal subsidiarity. And, and, and to think about the fact that where you live, that is uh, 
possibly where you'll be the rest of your life? And how do you learn to uh, strengthen that place you live so that everything you need is here? And that if you can't get it on your land, you get it as close as possible so that your resources are, are nurturing the area you're around. Don't always be buying something over the internet where the, the money you spend on that and the taxes you spend on that goes who knows where. Not just to another city or to another state, maybe to another country. And your local community suffers from the export of your resources to somewhere else. Turn it around. This is the teaching of the church. Turn it around and start here. Everything you need should come from family. What you can't get from family, you get from neighbors. What you can't share with neighbors comes your community. What you can't get from your community comes from your county, then comes from your state. Don't depend much on the federal government. That's last choice. Start at home. That's the teaching of the church on subsidiarity. The fifth thing is to live more simply. And that's what Paul and our Lord were talking about. Be content with, with uh, the clothes you have, uh, what you have. Don't tr somehow, over time, by grace, be content with less. And I have found, as I've gotten older, it's just made life a lot simpler. Uh, I'm far from being a model of simplicity. But the more I've grown in simplicity, the more I've grown in contentment. And six, now here's the hard one, and this isn't for everybody, and that's consider a more self-sufficient life on the land. Well, that's what I'm trying to do here, but I'm far from it. But that's one of my goals as I get older, hopefully my health will hold in there, to be not isolationist. We need the subsidiarity of our community but how can I be more and more self-sufficient as a family and therefore detached from the craziness that I can't control out there? And then lastly, is make more time for God. And I, I think what I said in my book is that the more we move along that journey from in simplicity, the more time we'll have to focus on God. This is just another way of looking at this idea of contentment. Godliness with contentment, as opposed to all the other false gospels that are out there uh, that people are trying to lure us, well, I was going to say, onto their paycheck. You know, they, this idea of being godliness is, is being face to face with God, standing in awe and trying to mirror him and then to do that, we need to be filtering our life with all the distraction. So I ended in Paul's statement about if we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content. And if you listen to that, you can't help but hear this is exactly what our Lord was saying on Sermon on the Mount when he was talking about the birds and the flowers and about the need of being content and, um, and seeking first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness and everything else we need will be provided. We need we probably not necessarily what we want. Then he goes on. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and hurtful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced their hearts with many pangs. Here's that familiar statement. Sometimes we hear it quoted that money is the root of all evil. And I'm sure you've heard from the pulpit many times the correction on that. The point is, it's the love of money. So the problem was with this section is the desire to be rich. God might, we're going to talk about this in a moment, God might bless our lives with property. He might bless our lives with resources, wealth. But it's the attitude in the, where's your desire? And what he's trying to say is our desire is to be like him. That's godliness, to be content with what we have. And he might provide, who knows, but, but to be content with that which he has provided for us. He goes on, but as for you, man of God, shun all this. Aim at righteousness, godliness, faith, 
love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Now, this is a verse I didn't see very clearly when I was teaching as a once saved, always saved uh, Protestant. But he's talking about two things here that are kind of subtle. One is fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Behind this is baptism. We see that in the early church. Even now on Easter, when we all stand and we, re, we respond to the Apostles' Creed, do you believe in, in God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth? And we all say yes. Another place, do you denounce Satan? Yes. And we go through the creed. Well, that's the profession that they're talking about that grew in the church. And that's where that creed came from, where the, the sentences that the new converts were to respond to when they entered into the church and then were baptized. That's the profession that he's talking about here. And then Paul is saying, hey, that it didn't end there. That's just a beginning. Our baptism confirmation is just a beginning. We are to fight the good fight of faith, to take hold, take hold of the eternal life to which we've been called. Paul's telling that to Timothy, and then Timothy was, is to go out and tell others. In the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus who is the testimony before, Pont of Pont before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach, from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, it's the call for perseverance by grace. Uh, every one of us is free to respond to grace. That means we can fall away. And so it becomes a daily battle in prayer and in diligence empowered by grace to remain faithful to the end. Jesus says in one of the uh, chapters right after the Sermon on the Mount, to those who, to those who persevere, those will be saved. That's the call, to keep the commandment unstained. And then he talks about this waiting and, and, uh, and anticipating the second coming of Christ. And most of us say it in the creed every Sunday, but we kind of live our lives of Christ has never come again. The teaching of the New Testament, as well as our Lord, was always to live in an anticipation as if day, this day is it. This day is it. He's coming tomorrow. So how would we live our lives differently if it was tomorrow we were going to stand before him? Is he going to see all the stuff we've filled our lives with? Or is he going to see people who've been content and have seek to grow in all those lists of the things he talks about, godliness and righteousness? And, and this will be made manifest at the proper time by the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So he brings us to a close. And that could have been a great end for this letter. A paragraph or two later, he gives the usual ending. Oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. So he, he's got something at the end. But in, he goes again back. And I'm just going to read this and then we'll get done. As for the rich in this world, Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God, who richly furnishes, furnishes us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good deeds, liberal and generous, generous, excuse me, thus laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life which is life indeed. So the point there is that Paul's not saying that if God has been generous with us, that the riches themselves, the wealth, the property in themselves are evil. It's that we've been given things for a reason. We've been given to let go of. We've been given to share. We've been given to enjoy. Our focus is not to be on the accumulation of more stuff, 
but to learn by grace to be content with what we have given and to be satisfied with that. Now, okay, how do we know what I've said is true? Am I just preaching another gospel? Well, I'm going to go back to Irenaeus and just focus on one last thing. Irenaeus is writing in the year 175. He's talked about that tradition that was passed on from Christ to his apostles to him, the gospel, the words of Christ and the teachings for holiness. And I've gone through what Paul was telling Timothy and trying to talk about how we can try and live those better today by grace. But how can we know in this 21st century where to go to make sure we're hearing the fullness? And Irenaeus, chapter three, excuse me, book three, chapter three, section two says one of the most important statements Irenaeus made. He says, the tradition, therefore, of the apostles made manifest in all the world, all may look back upon who wish to see things truly. And we are able to recount those whom the apostles appointed to be bishops in the churches and their successors, quite down to our time, who neither taught nor knew any such thing as they fondly devise. When he says they, here he means the Gnostic and false teachers. So he draws our attention back to the apostles. And then he says, okay, yet surely if the apostles had known any hidden mysteries which they used to teach the perfect apart and unknown to the rest, they would deliver it to those even more than others to whom they were entrusting the churches themselves. So the Gnostics are said, now we got a secret. We got a secret understanding of the gospel that Jesus gave to us privately and not. And he's saying, no, the apostles of the Lord would have given them to us. And they did. He says, but how do you, can you know? And this is where he says, but because it were very long in such a work as this to reckon up the succession of all the churches, which is one very great and most ancient and known to all. And so where do we go as a trustworthy foundation for that long tradition that has been received and guarded from the apostles? And Irenaeus says, we go to the most ancient and known to all, the church founded and established at Rome by two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul, whose tradition, which it hath from the apostles and her faith proclaimed unto men by succession of bishops coming down even unto us. For with this church, on account of its higher original, in other words, Peter and Paul, the whole church, I mean the faithful on all sides, must needs agree wherein the tradition which is of the apostles hath ever been preserved by them of all countries. And he goes on. All I can say is I am eternally grateful. First for all the blessings God has given me far more than I deserve. But I want to also add to that the blessing that I had in coming to know his church. It wasn't that I didn't know Christ before. It, didn't, it wasn't that I didn't have the scriptures before, but I remember standing in a pulpit and wondering, how can I be sure that what I'm teaching is true? How can I be sure that what my people are hearing from me is true, is salvific for their life? Because I want to make sure that I'm not just one of those puffed up teachers. And by God's grace, I just, re reminding those of you probably watching this who support our work, that the reason we have the Coming Home Network is to help those who may already know Christ know for certain that who they know is truly Him and what they are believing is true. And we know this through His church. God bless you.